so, so many of you are familiar with him, uh, both as a scholar, a critic, and uh, an activist. Um, as I have, many of you have followed not only his uh, sort of broad contours of his career, but also his voice, his inspiration. And in fact, if you're also like me, it's part of that voice, part of his uh, inspiration that has also helped you probably find your own as scholars and critics and as activists. In 2010, Noam gave a keynote address here at our closing plenary, where he spoke uh, very closely to that year's theme. And this year, when we thought of this uh, idea uh, you know, mobilizing for economic and ecologic transformation, his name immediately came to mind. As I was just relaying this to him backstage, I said, you know, it was so great that you paid such close attention to our theme uh, that we would really appreciate that. And he says, well, what is it this year? <laughs> uh, so I told him, and he said, great, well, that'll, that'll work perfectly. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we, we, we obviously we, we, we thought of him for a whole slew of general reasons, but also for his knowledge on these, on these particular topics, um, and also for his political compass. Always the kind of person that can help us figure out uh, sort of, you know, what to do at the, at the, tough, at the tough moments. Times of great uncertainty, deep crisis, and certainly times much like today. So please join me in a big New York City welcome for Mr. Noam Chomsky. things about tendencies in American society, uh, what they portend for us and for the world uh, in the light of uh, uh, U.S. power. It's uh, diminishing as it has been since 1945, but it's still incomparable. And it's dangerous. Uh, Obama's uh, remarkable global terror campaign and the pathetic reaction to it here are only one, it's only one example, I'll come to much more serious ones. Well, there is a kind of received doctrine about American society. We're supposed to be living in a capitalist democracy, which is the best possible system, despite some flaws. Uh, there have been interesting debates over the years uh, as to the uh, relation between capitalism and democracy, in fact whether they're even compatible, I won't be pursuing that because I'd like to keep to a different system of what we can call a really existing capitalist democracy, uh, R-E-C-D for short, uh, pronounced correct. <laughs> so, so to begin with, how does REC compare with democracy? Well, there's, uh, depends what we mean by democracy, of course. There are several versions. There's, again, a received doctrine that's a uh, sorry rhetoric of President Obama, 4th of July speeches, uh, which are taught in an 8th grade civics class. It's government of, by, and for the people. And it's easy to compare that with RECT. Uh, one of the main topics studied in professional political science is the relation between uh, attitudes and policy. We have a lot of information about attitudes, very heavily bold country and policy you can see. And the results are interesting. The best, best studies uh, basically show that for about 70% of the population, the lowest 70% on the wealth income scale, their opinions have no influence on policy. They're effectively disenfranchised. As you move up the scale, you get a little more influence by the time you get to the top, which these days is maybe a tenth of one percent, uh, you have basically you get what you want. Uh, so the proper term for that is uh, plutocracy, uh, or maybe uh, to take Jim Hightower's phrase, radical kleptocracy. Uh, uh, inquiries into the relation between public opinion and policy are kind of dangerous stuff. 
uh, as this illustrates. So you can see why Congress has just banned funding for them. So maybe we won't have to hear them anymore. Uh, this shows up clearly all the time. So the major domestic, take just say the major domestic issue. There's a split between the population and a, a tiny sector who essentially run things. For the population, the polls are very clear. The main problem is jobs. Uh, for the wealthy and corporate sector and the banks, the main problem is the deficit. Uh, so what do we have as policy? Well, the deficit. The sequester is not about jobs, it's about the deficit. Uh, and uh, the same is true on a very wide range of issues. So for example, one uh, takes a, uh, uh, a minimum wage. Uh, there are two views. Uh, one is that it should be indexed to the cost of living and should be high enough to prevent uh, falling below the poverty line. That's about 80% of the public among the decision makers, the rich and the powerful, it's about half that, uh, 40%. Uh, same with unions, same with uh, laws that encourage uh, union activity, uh, same on the public option for health care. Uh, for 35 years, as long as polls have been taken, large majorities have uh, held that corporations and the wealthy should pay higher taxes, well, on and on. Policy throughout is virtually the opposite of public opinion, and that's a typical property of RECT. Uh, back in the 1950s, uh, somebody, I, I think it may have been C. Wright Mills, uh, described the United States as a one-party state, the business party with two factions, the Democrats and Republicans, now that's no longer true. It's still a one-party state with the business party, but there's only one faction. It's moderate Republicans who now call themselves Democrats. Uh, there is something called the Republican Party, but long ago it abandoned any pretense of being a normal parliamentary party in the sense of Western societies. It's in lockstep service to the rich and the corporate sector as a catechism that everyone has to repeat. Uh, it raises a problem, how do you, how do you get votes? You can't get votes that way because it's totally opposed to the, by the majority, large majority of the public. Uh, so they've been compelled to mobilize sectors of the population. Now, they've always been there, but not as the base of a political party before. So religious extremists, uh, plenty of them in the United States, he was off the spectrum and religious extremism, uh, the nativists who were terrified that they are going to take over our country, uh, maybe attack us under the UN flag. So we have to have guns to protect ourselves. This is not a joke, incidentally. Or maybe to protect ourselves against uh, Obamacare, or maybe against the Sharia law that Obama is planning to impose, not just on the United States, but on the whole world. That's actually half of registered Republicans. Uh, and uh, uh, others like them, that's the base. And you saw it in an interesting way in the Republican primary. Uh, every time a candidate came out from the base, uh, there was terror in the Republican establishment because it was so lunatic. And they had to pour money in, tons of money, so they started pouring in for attack ads to knock them down so that the establishment could finally get their Wall Street guy. Now, this is not a joke. It has serious consequences. Uh, and it's worth remembering that it results very naturally from the shifts in the economy and the political system of the past generation, generation basically of a corporate uh, bipartisan uh, neoliberal assault on the population. So in brief, erect is very remote from the soaring rhetoric about democracy. But there's another version of democracy. It's the standard, it's also a standard doctrine, but of a different group. It's the standard doctrine of progressive uh, contemporary democratic theory. And so I'll give you some illustrative quotes. This is from the kind of left end of the mainstream spectrum. 
quotes. The public are ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. They have to be put in their place. Decisions must be in the hands of an intelligent minority of responsible men. They have to be protected from the trampling and the roar of the bewildered herd. The herd has what's called a function. It's to show up every couple of years and lend their weight between one of, between a choice among the responsible men. Uh, but apart from that, their function is to be spectators, not participants. And that's for their own good, because we should not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about people being the best judges of their own interests. No, they're not. Uh, we are. And therefore, they're, they should be kept as spectators. Their attitudes and opinions must be controlled. It's necessary to regiment their minds the way an army regiments its bodies. It's necessary to um, discipline the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young, <coughs> churches, schools, universities. And uh, maybe if we do all this, we can get back to the good old days, quoting now, when Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. Well, many of you ought to be able to recognize the sources of the quotes from icons of the liberal establishment, uh, leading progressive democratic theorists. So that's another version of democracy. Actually, the roots of that version uh, go back to 17th century England, the first democratic revolution, 1640s, the civil war between uh, king and parliament, and the gentry, the men of best quality, as they call themselves, now, they were appalled by rising popular forces who were saying that they didn't want to be governed by either king or parliament. I'm quoting now. They didn't want to be governed by, ruled by knights and gentlemen who do but oppress us, but governed by countrymen like ourselves who know the people's sores. But that was coming from the rabble, and it was a terrifying sight and uh, major efforts were made and at that time carried out to crush them. Uh, same was true a century later, founding fathers of the American Republic, same picture. Now uh, they, you look back at the Constitutional Convention, they determined, do quote, that power must be in the hands of the wealth of the nation, of those who have sympathy for property owners and their rights, and who understand that a fundamental task of government is to protect the minority of the opulent from the majority. Now that's James Madison in the Constitutional Convention, what you read in the federal pa Federalist Papers, what you read in school, that was mostly propaganda trying to get a recalcitrant population to accept the constitutional structure. Uh, the constitutional system was actually constructed on that basis very explicitly adhering to the principle that was enunciated by the, uh, the, uh, the president of the Constitutional Convention, first Chief Justice Supreme Court, John Jay, which is that those who own the country ought to govern it. Now, there have been a lot of popular struggles since that time. Uh, they've won many victories, but the masters don't relent. They keep to the same positions that the gentry had in the 17th century. The more freedom is won, the more intense are the efforts to redirect the society to a proper course. Uh, 20, 20th century progressive democratic theory, the kind that I just uh, sampled, is basically that of the men of best quality of the 17th century, the founders of the American Republic, and uh, not very different from you know, the wreck that has been achieved. Apart from one question, of who are the responsible men who should rule? Should it be bankers or intellectual elites? Or for that matter, should it be the Central Committee in another version of essentially the same doctrines? Uh, well, there's another important feature of RECT, and that is that the public has to be kept in the dark about what's happening to them. That's crucial. The herd has to remain bewildered. And there are reasons for that. Uh, they were explained lucidly by the professor of the science of government at Harvard. There is such a chair, uh, Samuel Huntington, 
he pointed to this pretty honest guy. He said that power remains strong when it remains in the dark. Exposed to sunlight, it begins to evaporate. Uh, that's on the front pages right now. Uh, Bradley Manning, for example, is facing life in prison for failure to comprehend this scientific principle, which is quite a uh, And it works pretty well. Uh, polls illustrate it quite interestingly. Uh, the polls show that the Republican, Republicans are preferred to the, Demo to the Democrats on most issues, including the crucial issues on which the public opposes their policies. Uh, one striking case is that a considerable majority say that they favor the Republicans on tax policy, but the same majorities oppose those policies. Uh, that's even true of the far right Tea Party people. Uh, results like those, which are pretty consistent, uh, right. illustrate demoralization of the public in a kind that's unusual, though there are examples, uh, not attractive ones. The late Weimar Republic comes to mind. Well, the task of uh, ensuring that the rabble keep to their function as bewildered spectators, they take many forms. One simple means is simply to re restrict entry into the political system. Uh, Iran's having elections right now. And it's rightly criticized because candidates have to be vetted by the Guardian Council of Clerics. Uh, here, we don't have that. Here, they're vetted by concentrations of private capital. Uh, mechanisms are too familiar to review, so I'll leave it aside. But that's not safe enough either. There are huge institutions in the United States developed over the past century uh, to uh, uh, dedicated uh, to uh, undermining the received version of democracy in the eighth grade civics class version. It's called the public relations industry. Uh, they run elections, and the goal of the electoral campaign is run by the PR industry is to create uninformed voters who make irrational decisions, like the kind I just illustrated in polls. Uh, and they know what they're doing. And so, for example, as you may recall, after Obama's election in 2008, a couple months later, the advertising uh, industry had its annual convention. Every year, they give an award for the best marketing campaign of the year. And that year they gave it to Obama. He beat out Apple Computer. He was able to delude the public better than And uh, there, was, there were interesting reports about it in the business press, Financial Times in London, uh, quoting executives who are just euphoric. You know, they have a new style they can follow. You know, they used to have Reagan style, now they can follow the Obama style. Great way of undermining democracy. And it's a pretty easy transition for the public relations industry uh, from their major goal, their major commitment, which is to undermine markets. Uh, markets, if you took an economics course, are supposed to be based on informed consumers making rational choices, <coughs> nice theorems. Uh, but anyone who's looked at a television ad knows that the purpose is to create uninformed consumers who will make irrational choices. Uh, that's uh, the main task of commercial advertising when it turns to running elections, undermines democracy in the same way. Well, the core of the economy today is financial institutions, it's vast expansion since the 1970s with the financialization of the economy and the accelerated shift of production abroad and very rapid changes in the character of financial institutions. So those of you who are old enough will remember that a bank used to be a place where you put in a little extra money and lend it to somebody to buy a car or something like that. But those days are gone. The financial institutions are totally different from what they do. And they're huge. They had 40% the of corporate profits in 2007, right on the eve of the financial crisis that 
for which they were largely responsible. Well, it's interesting that after the crisis, around 2008-2009, uh, a number of leading economists, among them uh, Robert Solow, a Nobel laureate from MIT, uh, Ben Friedman of Harvard, a couple of others, uh, began to look into what the function, what the impact is of the financial institutions on the economy. It's kind of an interesting gap, considering their scale. Uh, uh, well, Solow and Friedman both pointed out that economists hadn't done much study of the impact of financial institutions. And both of them thought that it's probably negative, uh, their harm to the economy. Now, there are some who are much more outspoken. Also, the most respected uh, financial correspondent in the English-speaking world, uh, Martin Wolf of the London Financial Times, you know, he describes the he says that the out-of-control financial sector is eating out the market economy from inside, just as the larva of a spider wasp eats out the host in which it has been laid by the market economy. He means the productive economy. I'll get back to what it actually is. Uh, there's a recent issue of one of the main business journals, Bloomberg Business Week, which reviews a, an IMF study that just came out which concluded that the biggest banks make no profit. Uh, what they earn traces to the government insurance policy. Uh, so there's a widely publicized bailout, but that's the least of it. It goes way beyond that. Now, the editors of the journal say that this is crucial to understanding why the big banks present such a threat to the global economy and to the people of the country, of course. Uh, after the crash, the first serious attention took place in the economics profession uh, to what's called systemic risk. The risk that when you make a transaction, it'll have effects elsewhere, like maybe bringing down the whole system. It's called systemic risk. It's called an externality. It's a footnote in economics tests. Text is one of the flaws of market systems. It's externality is pretty big, and they're much more serious ones than this. Well, there is an effort uh, to put some limits on the larva that's eating out the economy, and incidentally preparing the way for the next crash, as it's very definitely doing. The Dodd-Frank bill, as you've probably been reading, there's the Congress is being besieged by huge armies of corporate lobbyists uh, who are making sure that the bills defanged won't have an effect. Uh, there's also uh, things like the spectacle, comment in a way, I guess, of the chief executive of Apple testifying before the Senate recently about how they managed to avoid paying taxes, even with billions of dollars of uh, profits. And he had the senators eating out of his hand. It's kind of interesting to watch. Uh, because uh, what he pointed out to them, which is correct, uh, is that uh, Apple was just following the laws that they wrote. He didn't point out that the laws that they wrote were written by lobbyists for Apple. But, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a very extreme case of what's sometimes called regulatory capture. You know, the industries take control of the regulatory apparatus that's supposed to regulate them, in this case, Congress. Uh, it's so comical that the New York Times business correspondent wrote that maybe corporate taxes should just be kissed goodbye. There's no way to get corporations to pay them, so let's forget the whole farce. Actually, that's not necessarily the case. There are interesting proposals as to how to get around it, very simple ones. One goes back to E.F. Schumacher, who was revived recently by economist Dean Baker. Now that is that companies should give non-voting stock to the government. Now that's effectively a corporate tax that can't be evaded, uh, and a very simple way to ensure it. But unfortunately, under REC, that's about as likely to be enacted as a financial transactions tax that would eliminate the uh, larva that's eating away at the economy and uh, uh, direct investment to productive 
purposes and, of course, bring in a ton of revenue. Well, what about the productive economy, what's called the market economy and the standard mantra? Uh, the standard story is that the productive economy is based on entrepreneurial initiative and consumer choice in a free market. In reality, it's based on massive state intervention. Uh, one of the most striking examples is the IT revolution, which is like core of the growing sector of the economy. Now, that was based on information technology. Now, the hard and the costly work, uh, substantially in the state sector for decades, uh, places like my university, for example, like the lab where I was working for decades, uh, zero consumer choice. There was some entrepreneurial initiative, uh, but mostly limited to how to get government grants uh, and how to get bailouts, tons of bailouts, and also to ensure procurement. Uh, procurement is one of the major ways, uh, often ignored, uh, to ensure co corporate profit, like you get the government to buy, but you can't sell computers that are too expensive to go to Los Alamos. Uh, that kind of thing. Well, it's not quite that simple, but that's actually the core part of the picture of the productive economy. The system goes way back, but uh, dramatically true since World War II. Well, another crucial aspect of RECT is sharp concentration of capital. Development of oligopoly also undermines any kind of markets. In just the last 20 years, the share of profits of the 200 largest enterprises uh, have risen very sharply. Uh, these developments also undermine the mantra. It's an interesting topic, I won't pursue it. Uh, instead of going on with this, uh, I'd like to turn to something else. Uh, how does the future fare under RECT? And uh, the answer is pretty grim. Uh, it's no secret that there are a number of dark shadows that hover over every topic we discuss. There are two that are particularly ominous. One is environmental catastrophe, and the other is nuclear war, both of which are very serious and indeed growing threats to decent survival. Well, I'm not going to say much about environmental catastrophe. I think you all know about it. The scale of the danger is obvious to anyone with eyes open. And particularly people who read the scientific literature. Uh, each issue of a major scientific journal has more dire warnings than the last one. Uh, and uh, uh, there are various reactions to this. It's not a secret. Uh, at one extreme, there are some who are trying to act, act decisively if possible to prevent a possible catastrophe. At the other extreme, there are major efforts underway to accelerate the threats to march off the cliff as quickly as possible, like the proverbial Lenin. Well, leading the effort to uh, intensify the likely disaster is the richest and most powerful country in world history, with incomparable advantages, and the most prominent example of wrecked. Uh, leading the effort to preserve conditions in which our immediate descendants might have a decent life are the so-called primitive societies, uh, First Nations, uh, Aboriginal, Tribal, uh, so on. And the scale is pretty remarkable. So last year, for example, there were over a thousand actions recorded by indigenous people, uh, efforts to defend the earth, as they put it. Uh, the countries with large and influential indigenous populations are well in the lead in seeking to defend the earth. The countries that have driven indigenous populations to virtual extinction or extreme marginalization are racing enthusiastically towards destruction. So for example, Ecuador, which is an oil producer and has a large indigenous population, is seeking to get aid from the rich countries, which it won't get, uh, to keep its substantial oil reserves in the ground, which is where they ought to be. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. and Canada, super rich, are enthusiastically seeking to burn every drop of fossil fuels, including the extremely dangerous Canadian tar sands, 
and to do it as quickly and as fully as possible while they hail the wonders of a largely meaningless uh, energy independence, a century of energy independence means nothing, without a side glance at what the world might look like after this extravagant commitment to self-destruction. Uh, every issue of the daily papers uh, illustrates it amply, illustrates this lunacy, and that's the right word for it. All is exactly the opposite of what elementary rationality would demand, except for the skewed form of rationality that flows naturally from wrecked. Well, there are massive corporate campaigns to try to safeguard the lunacy, but they haven't been enough. It turns out that there's a real problem in American society. The public is still too committed to scientific rationality. Uh, one of the many divergences between opinion and policy uh, is that the American public is quite close to the international norm in concern about the environment and in calling for serious measures to prevent catastrophe. Meanwhile, bipartisan policy is dedicated to bringing it on, George W. Bush's famous phrase. Uh, well, fortunately, uh, this solution to this is a corporate-funded organization that you know about, uh, ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, and they're riding to the rescue. Uh, as you know, ALEC designs legislation for states. There's no need to comment on what kind of legislation. And they're now instituting an educational program for states. It's a program to overcome the excessive rationality of the public. It's a K-12 program which is, according to its propaganda, to improve critical faculties by balanced teaching. So balanced teaching means that if a sixth grade class is learning something about the climate, that has to be balanced by teaching them about climate change denial. Uh, improve their critical faculties. Uh, maybe it's hoped that that'll overcome the failure of the massive corporate propaganda campaign to make the population ignorant and irrational enough to safeguard a short-term profit for the rich. Uh, we have to remember that these are deep-seated institutional properties of wrecked. They're built into the institutions and not easy to uproot. And all of this is quite apart from the institutional necessity to maximize short-term profit while ignoring an externality that's vastly more serious even than systemic risk, which just brings down the financial system periodically. Uh, for that market failure, you know, the culprits can go cap in hand to the taxpayer who can restore their wealth and power. That's what we're seeing right now. But in the case of the uh, destruction of the conditions for decent existence, there's no guardian angel around who can bail you out. And for this reason alone, the prospects for decent survival under wrecked are quite dim. Well, let's turn to the other dark shadow, nuclear war. It's a threat that's been with us for 70 years. Uh, still is, in some ways it's growing. Uh, one fundamental reason for this is that under wrecked, uh, the rights and the needs of the general population are a minor matter, and that extends to security. There's another prevailing doctrine, in particular in the academic professions, those of you who know about, say, international relations theory are familiar with this, now, the doctrine is that uh, governments seek to protect national security. It's mostly myth. Uh, they seek to extend power and domination of their core constituency, whatever the, whatever the domestic concentration of power is, um, U.S. corporate sector. And the consequence is that systematically, security just does not have a high priority. Uh, we see that all the time, uh, right now, in fact. So take, say, uh, 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 Obama's uh, operation to murder Osama bin Laden, prime suspect for the 9-11 attack. He just gave a 
big speech on May 23rd, plenty of publicity on national security, it's supposed to be a major speech. Uh, there's one passage in it that seems to have been ignored, uh, but it's important. Uh, Obama hailed the operation, you know, pride and credit for it, but he added that it cannot be the norm, and I'll quote his reasons. The reasons are that the risks were immense. The SEALs might have been embroiled in an extended firefight, uh, but even though with luck that didn't happen, the cost to our relationship with Pakistan and the backlash among the Pakistani public over the encroachment on their territory was so severe that we are just now beginning to rebuild this important partnership. Uh, one example was this morning, uh, yesterday, the new president announced loudly that we can't have any more drone attacks in Pakistan this morning. It was another one, a village somewhere. That's how we improve our partnership. Also create plenty of terrorists. Every one of them is a terrorist generating device. Well, let's add a couple of details that Obama didn't mention. The SEALs were ordered to fight their way out if they were apprehended. If they had been, they wouldn't have been left to their fate if they'd been, in Obama's words, embroiled in an extended firefight. The full force of the U.S. military it would have been used to extricate them. Pa Pakistan has a powerful military, well-trained, highly protected of state sovereignty. Also, of course, has nuclear weapons, thanks in large part to Ronald Reagan. And the uh, leading Pakistani specialists are quite concerned by the exposure of these systems to jihadi elements. Now, this could have escalated the nuclear war. In fact, it came pretty close. Uh, while the SEALs were still in, in Laden's compound, the Pakistani chief of staff, Kayani, was informed of the invasion. And he ordered his staff to confront any unidentified aircraft. He assumed they were probably coming from India. And meanwhile, in Kabul, the General Petraeus of the Central Command ordered U.S. warplanes to respond if the Pakistanis scrambled their fighter jets. Well, as Obama said, by luck it didn't happen. But the risk was faced, and strikingly, without concern. Very significant fact. Uh, there's a lot more to say about that particular operation than its immense cost to Pakistan. But instead, let's take a look more closely at the concern for security by state authorities, and keeping the security from instant destruction by nuclear weapons. So put aside the radical lack of concern for terrorism. It's surreal to listen to Obama today to say we have to take everyone's phone calls because we want to protect you from terrorism. Meanwhile, they're doing everything they can to increase terrorism. From the highest level, it's familiar that the global terror campaign, you know, the drone campaign, is just generating potential terrorists, obviously. I mean, if, and it is, if, uh, drones, remember, are terror weapons. If, and they're designed that way. I mean, if you don't know whether five minutes from now the guy across the street is going to be blown away from, by somebody you know, thousands of miles away with everybody who happens to be around him, you're terrorized, and whole regions are terrorized this way, and it has consequences. And people don't like it, and they react. And you get people we call terrorists. So it's a terror-generating campaign, and it's not the only case. Uh, the invasion of Iraq is a striking case. Uh, U.S. and British intelligence warned the governments that the invasion of Iraq was likely to increase terror. Well, they didn't care. But, you know, I can mention in the memoirs. And in fact, it did. Uh, terror increased by a factor of seven in the first year after the invasion. It's a big increase. That's from Rand Corporation, quasi government statistics. Uh, but it's just not an issue. But let's turn to the more serious case uh, destruction, instant destruction by nuclear weapons. What about that? Well, it turns out that's never been a concern for state authorities. And there are many striking examples, I'll give you a few. Now, take, say, uh, around 1950, 
the U.S. was in a position of extraordinary security. Uh, half the world's wealth uh, controlled the hemisphere, both oceans, opposite sides of both oceans. Uh, other powers were devastated or destroyed. Incredible security. There was one potential threat, potential. ICBMs with uh, hydrogen bomb warheads. The Russians knew that they were way behind in technology, contrary to a lot of propaganda. And they offered the United States a treaty to ban ICBMs with nuclear warheads. But that would have been a tremendous uh, uh, step forward for the security of Americans. But there's a history of nuclear weapons, kind of a standard history by George Bundy. He was a national security advisor for Kennedy and Johnson. He had access to high-level documents. And he kind of mentions in passing, mentions this in passing. And he says he wasn't even able to find a staff paper that even considered it. You know, not that it was considered and rejected, it was that nobody considered it, who cares? So we'll go wiped out by ICBMs. Let's go on to the next stop. Uh, in 1952, Stalin made a pretty remarkable offer. He offered to public, uh, to allow Germany to be reunified with democratic elections under international <laughs> supervision, which the West is sure to win, but on condition that it be demilitarized. Let me take a look at Russian history. Uh, Germany alone had practically wiped out Russia several times in the past half century, and as part of the Western military, the hostile military alliance, it was a tremendous threat. Well, that was public, so it was mentioned. And uh, there were some people who said it should be taken seriously, like James Warburg, influential commentator, but it was just ridicule. It was dismissed with ridicule. Well, by now, Russian archives are coming out, and it turns out that it was apparently serious. And now, scholarship, even right-wing scholarship, is beginning to take it seriously. Well, if it had been taken seriously at the time, and it was real, which it might have been, could have led to a sharp reduction in the threat of war, and of course also uh, undercut the official reason for NATO. Uh, in the late 1950s, uh, Khrushchev came in. He knew the Russians were way behind. Uh, he offered the United States a deal, sharp cutback in offensive weapons, mutual cutback in offensive weapons, so that Russia could use its much more limited resources for economic development. Uh, the Eisenhower administration didn't pay much attention. The Kennedy administration did. They paid attention and decided to reject it in favor of an increase in offensive weapons, sharp increase. In fact, Khrushchev went ahead and actually unilaterally carried out the reduction, but that just led to a sharper increase under the Kennedy administration. Well, you don't have to talk about that. Uh, uh, the, uh, in fact, that's one reason why Khrushchev placed missiles in Cuba in 1962, to try to balance the huge American advantage. Uh, there was another reason. Uh, uh, Kennedy, as you probably know, was carrying out a massive terror campaign against Cuba, Operation Mongoose, huge terrorist campaign. And it was scheduled uh, to lead to an invasion, a U.S. invasion in October 1962. Well, the Russians and the Cubans presumably knew about that. It was in October 1962 that the missiles were put in. And that led to uh, what uh, is called the most dangerous moment in history by historian Arthur Schlesinger, Kennedy's advisor. Um, then followed extremely tense weeks. They culminated on October 26th 1962. At that time, B-52s armed with nuclear weapons were ready to attack Moscow. Uh, the cruise command system was such that crews could have proceeded without central command, just by the crew's decision. Uh, uh, Kennedy himself was leaning towards military action to remove the missiles from Cuba. His subjective estimate at the time, was that the probability of nuclear war would 
maybe a third of a half. Uh, at that point, a letter came from Khrushchev to Kennedy, a private letter, uh, with a proposal to end the crisis. Uh, end the crisis by mutual withdrawal, of public withdrawal of Russian missiles from Cuba and US missiles from Turkey. Well, actually, Kennedy hadn't even known that there were missiles in Turkey. And in fact, at that time, they were being withdrawn because they were obsolete. Uh, they were being replaced by invul invulnerable Polaris submarines. So the offer is, we'll withdraw the missiles from Cuba, you withdraw the missiles that you're already withdrawing from Turkey, withdrawing because they're obsolete, a bigger threat, and it'll be public and it'll all be over. No more dangerous moment in history. Well, Kennedy refused. In my view, that's probably the most horrendous decision in human history. He was willing to take a huge risk of destroying the world to establish a principle. The principle is that we have a right to threaten anyone with destruction any way we like, but it's a unilateral right. And no one else can threaten us, even to deter a planned invasion. And worse still is the lesson that's been drawn from this. Kennedy is praised for his cool courage under pressure. Well, the threats continued. And 10 years later, in 1973, and Kissinger called a nuclear alert. This was in the middle of the uh, end of the Arab-Israeli war. But the reason that he called the nuclear alert was that uh, the, US, the US and Russia had been, uh, uh, made a deal to impose a ceasefire uh, to end the fighting. But Kissinger had privately informed Israel that they could ignore the ceasefire. And the nuclear alert was to tell the Russians, keep out. This is the way we're playing the game. It didn't lead to war. And 10 years later, Ronald Reagan came in uh, and his administration decided to probe Russian defenses by simulating air and naval attacks, uh, also placing Pershing missiles in Germany, which had a five-minute flight time to Russian targets, provided what the CIA called a super sudden first strike capability. Well, not surprisingly, this caused a lot of alarm in Russia, which, unlike the United States, is quite vulnerable and had repeatedly been invaded and virtually destroyed. That led to a major war scare in 1983. Uh, current issue, it's recently been discovered how serious it was. The current issue of the Journal of Strategic Studies says it almost became a prelude to a Russian preventative nuclear strike, in which case we wouldn't be talking here. Uh, there are newly released archives which reveal that the danger was much more severe than historians had assumed. There's a current CIA study. It's called The War Scare Was For Real. It concludes that US intelligence underestimated the threat of a Russian preventative nuclear strike. They took it seriously when it looked as if the US was invading their country, surprisingly. And it continues, I won't run through the record, but the most recent case is the Bin Laden assassination, and there are more waiting. And three of them are on the front pages right now, so let's take a brief look at those. North Korea, Iran, and China. So take North Korea. It's issuing, uh, government's issuing uh, wild, uh, dangerous threats attributed here to the lunacy of the leaders. Uh, could be the worst government in the world, make a case for that. But if we want to reduce the threats, instead of to march blindly in unison, now there are a couple of things to consider. Now, the current crisis began with a US, with US South Korean war games, right on the border of North Korea. And for the first time ever, quote the official description, they included simulation of pre preemptive attack in an all-out war scenario against North Korea. Uh, they also led to simulated nuclear bombing on North Korea's borders by B-52s and uh, B-2s, the most sophisticated machines of destruction in the world. Uh, well, you know, that brings up some memories for the North Korean leadership. Uh, for example, they can remember the 
that there was a superpower that virtually leveled the entire country 60 years ago. And when there was nothing left to, to, to bomb, put it all flat, uh, the U.S. turned to bombing dams. It's a war crime for which people were hanged at Nuremberg. And uh, even if we choose not to look, uh, they probably read the documents. For example, the official Air Force records, uh, which are exult at the time, just you should read them, they exult over the glorious sight of massive floods, unquote, that scooped clear 27 miles of valley below, that devastated 75% of the controlled water supply for North Korea's rice production, sending the commissars scurrying to the press and radio centers to blare to the world the most severe hate-filled harangues to come from the communist propaganda mill in the three years of the war. Uh, to the communists, the smashing of the dam <coughs> meant primarily the destruction of their chief sustenance, rice. The Westerners can little conceive the awesome meaning uh, which the loss of this staple food supply has for the Asians, the starvation and slow death, and hence the show of rage, the flare of violent <coughs> tempers, and the threat of reprisals when bombs fell on five irrigation dams. That's the uh, lunatic kooks. Well, like, uh, it's worth reading in full. This is the official Air Force record. But like other potential targets, the crazed North Korean leaders can also read high-level documents that outline U.S. strategic document. One of the most important is a study by the Clinton years by Stratcom, strategic command, which is in charge of nuclear strategy and controlling nuclear weapons. It's called Essentials of Cold War Deterrence. It's about the role of nuclear weapons in the post-Cold War era. And its central conclusions are, even, the U.S. must maintain first right of first strike, even against non-nuclear states. Furthermore, Nuclear weapons must always be available because they cast a shadow over any crisis or conflict, meaning they're constantly used, and just as you're using a gun, if you, even if you don't fire it, if you go in to rob a store and aim it at the store owner. That's a point that Dan Ellsberg's been trying to make for many years. Uh, Stratcom goes on to say that Planners should not be too rational about determining what the opponent values the most, all of which must be targeted. It hurts to portray ourselves as too fully rational and cool-headed, that the U.S. may become irrational and vindictive if its vital interests are attacked, should be part of the national persona we project. It's beneficial for our strategic posture if some elements may appear to be out of control. Well, there's also a recent history that the North Korean leaders know very well. I won't review it because it's too late. Uh, but it's quite interesting and it's revealing. I'll just summarize. I'll quote a mainstream scholarly summary. North Korea has been playing tit for tat, reciprocating whenever Washington cooperates, retaliating whenever Washington reneges. It's doubtless a horrible place, but the record suggests directions that could be taken to reduce the threat of war, if that were the intention. It's certainly not military maneuvers and simulated nuclear bombing. Well, let's turn to what's called the gravest threat to peace. That's Obama's words repeated dutifully in the press, uh, Iran's nuclear program. A couple of questions arise to any rational mind out of the right sense of rationality. So one question is, who thinks it's a threat? The second is, what is the threat? The third, what can we do about it? So who thinks it's a threat? Answer is very simple. It's a Western obsession, primarily the United States. Non-aligned countries don't think so. The Arab countries don't, the Arab populations don't think so. The dictators may, but not the populations. They don't like Iran, but don't regard it as a threat. It's the United States and a couple of its allies. Why is it a threat? Well, we know the answer from the highest level sources, the uh, 
Pentagon and uh, the intelligence community. They present regular analyses of the global security situation in Congress. They, of course, talk about the Iranian threat. And what they point out is that Iran poses no military threat. There's no capacity, to, limited capacity to deploy force. And if they're developing nuclear weapons, which we don't know, that would be part of their deterrent strategy. Well, that's a threat. Uh, the U.S. cannot tolerate a deterrent. No rogue power can accept a deterrent. Uh, you have to be free to threaten or use force whenever you like under doctrines of the kind I quoted. So deterrents are a real threat. Well, that leads to the third question. What can you do about the threat, whatever you think it is? Now, there are a number of possibilities. I'll just keep the one, the most interesting one. Uh, one straightforward possibility is to move to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. Overwhelming international support. It's, uh, for years, it's been pressed in the international arena, primarily by the Arab states, Egypt in the lead, but uh, non-aligned countries uh, urge it, and almost everyone does. Uh, so what can you do? Well, a lot of things. For example, last December, there was a great way to move forward. There was an international conference plan in Helsinki to carry forward efforts to try to create a nuclear weapons-free zone. Uh, big question. Israel said they wouldn't attend. Okay, that was expected. Uh, your question is, what will Iran do? In early November, Iran announced that they would attend. A couple of days later, Obama canceled the conference. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, and what does that mean? Well, that the European Parliament passed a resolution calling for it to resume. The Arab states called on it to resume. It was actually an NGO conference. It doesn't mean anything. If the United States blocks it, it can't happen. Uh, well, what happens then? Uh, possibly march on to war. It's a very dangerous war, which could easily get out of hand. And that's forecast. Uh, shortly after the Helsinki conference was banned by Obama, there was another conference. It was run by the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. It's an APAC offshoot that the press pretends is a neutral agency. It's one of the main sources of information. Uh, it was an important conference. It was attended by Dennis Ross, Elliot Abrams, and other, quoting, former top advisors to Obama and Bush. I'm quoting from the Israeli press. I didn't see a report. Uh, they assured the audience, I'm quoting, that the president will strike Iran in 2013 if diplomacy doesn't succeed. That was a pretty uh, upbeat uh, uh, conference. Finally got it, in other words. Well, of course, diplomacy can succeed if the options are blocked. And crucially, the population here can't be organized to fend off the threat of war because they don't know anything about this. And that's taken care of very easily. There hasn't been one word about this anywhere in the free press. That's discipline for you, not coming from the government. You know? not coming by command, it's just understood there's some things you don't say like these. Well, let's take the last of the potential confrontations, China. The Chinese, too, have memories, even recent ones. Like they have memories from 1962, the most dangerous moment in history. And six months before the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy sent uh, uh, nuclear-armed missiles to Okinawa, aimed at China at a very tense moment then in the China conflict, if you remember. Well, that's sort of passed without comment here. As I said, we have the right to threaten anyone with nuclear destruction any time. Uh, so we'll skip that. But the Chinese don't necessarily skip it. And they can look at what's going on right around them. So let's call the pivot to Asia, so new upgraded military bases in Northwest Australia, and Vietnam, and Philippines. South Korea, Jeju Island, and then there's Japan and the U.S. Pacific Islands. You just take a look at a map. Now, these form what China can't 
help but see as a threatening arc of military power surrounds them and surrounds the waters that are crucial for their commerce. As far as I know, no Chinese bases have yet been discovered surrounding the United States or in fact anywhere. It's kind of striking to see how this confrontation is formulated here. We learn a lot about the doctrinal character of Rick from that. So for example, last month the New York Times had an article on China's military buildup. They said it was quite ominous. It's a tiny fraction of error. This, quote, this was, it was a serious challenge to the United States in the waters around China. <laughs> not in the Caribbean, not the waters off California, where of course it would be tolerated for a moment. If you turn to the strategic analysis literature, sober analysts, they describe the US-China confrontation as what they call a classic security dilemma in which each side sees fundamental interests at stake over control of the waters around China. Uh, the US regards its policy of controlling these waters as defensive, while China regards them as threatening. Uh, similarly, China isn't happy when the US sends the nuclear aircraft carrier George Washington to waters that place Beijing within the range of its nuclear missiles. You can imagine the reaction if China did anything remotely like that. Well, this classic security dilemma, again, makes sense on the assumption that the US has a right to control the world and that US security, whatever that means, requires something approaching total global control phrase for that from George Bush number one, what we say goes and the world better understand it. Uh, let me end by suggesting that you think about all of this in a broader historical perspective. It's useful. It will soon be commemorating the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, which foundations of modern law. We won't be celebrating the occasion. More likely, we're, we'll be interring what's left of its bones as after Bush and Obama have finished ripping off the flesh. Magna Carta had two components, one pretty well known, the other long forgotten, but they were equal. One was the Charter of Liberties, the other was what's called the Charter of the Forests. The first, the Charter of Liberties, formulated fundamental principles of law, like presumption of innocence, state cannot punish until guilt has been established by a speedy trial before a jury of peers in an honest court. Now, these rights were extended over the centuries, and in the past decade, they've been eviscerated, shredded further under Obama. Uh, today, you see more. Now, the second, the Charter of the Forests, called for protection of the commons from the depredations of authority. Uh, well, that, uh, uh, the commons were the traditional source of uh, sustenance and welfare. Uh, they uh, were carefully nurtured over centuries by the general population, improved and cared for. And uh, they've been steadily dismantled under the capitalist principle that everything has to be privately owned which carries with it a kind of perverse doctrine that we're all familiar with. It's called the tragedy of the commons. That it's supposed to hold that uh, collective possession will be despoiled, so it better be privately owned. Actually, the merest glance at the world shows that the opposite is true. It's privatization that's destroying the commons. Now, the indigenous populations of the world who still remember something about 800 years ago uh, they're in the lead in trying to save Magna Carta from final destruction by its inheritors and the prospect for decent existence with it. And they are joined by others. That's where the hope lies. The uh, courageous demonstrators who are protecting Gezi Park from bulldozers in Tuxim Square right now. seeking to 
protect the last remnants of the commons in Istanbul from the wrecking ball of commercial destruction and gentrification and autocracy. Some of them call themselves Occupy Gezi, uh, drawing inspiration from Zuccotti Park and the Wisconsin uprising. Uh, these were heartened by measures of solidarity from working people in Tupper Square. They soon linked to similar uprisings in uh, Europe, uh, in place right now, Greece, elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, uh, all of these have a lot in common. They're resisting the dedicated destruction of the welfare state of the social contract. It's one of Europe's significant contributions to modern civilization. And all of that is part of a violent neoliberal assault on the population of the world. And the uprisings have registered some successes, some of them pretty spectacular. Now, the most extreme in Latin America is in this millennium, Latin America has largely freed itself from the lethal grip of imperial domination for the first time in 500 years. Well, the picture of, the general picture I've been sketching is grim, but there are shafts of light like these. And as always throughout history, there's two trajectories in parallel. The one is towards oppression, destruction. The other is towards justice and freedom. And as always, uh, that Martin Luther King's famous phrase, there are ways to bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice and freedom, and by now, even towards survival. Thanks. Thank you, Noam, of course. Uh, the breadth of that historical uh, reach and the, the depth of your analysis is always so inspiring, so amazing. Um, I want to, uh, uh, once again, give, give thanks to, no to Noam for stopping here on such a busy schedule. And uh, at our first sort of Saturday afternoon event, which will probably be more of again. Thank you once again, Noam. about a half more to go. The rest of today, all of tomorrow. Um, this evening, in this room, at 7.30, we're going to host a special Saturday night plenary uh, with Oliver Stone.